It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thanks uh, so much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is to the Premier. The dream of home ownership is fading fast for Ontarians. Their hopes are being dashed. Renters are terrified that they'll be the next ones to be rent evicted or see their rents jacked up by 20 or 30 percent by their landlord. Yet yesterday, the Ford government tabled legislation that literally does nothing to address the housing crisis that Ontarians are facing. So my question is, why has this Premier thrown up his hands and literally given up on the housing crisis facing Ontarians? Order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Oh, Speaker, I, I, I just don't know where this, uh, this uh, Leader of the Opposition stands. We've made a commitment from the first day we set in the Legislature Order. that we were going to make housing supply a priority of the government. We delivered Order. in 2019 on More Homes, More Choice, our housing supply action plan. We acknowledge that the Housing Affordability Task Force is the long-term roadmap for the government. Uh, but but our, our bill yesterday, More Homes from Everyone, recognizes what everyone, other than the Leader of the Opposition, acknowledges, is that it takes too long to get housing built. We need to have municipalities on board, Speaker. We need to make sure that both levels of government work together to deliver housing that meets people's needs and their expectations, Speaker. That's what we're Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Okay. Member for Waterloo, come to order. Member for London North Centre, come to order. Minister of Education, come to order. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. The government's inaction plan has been a dismal failure. Young families face the real prospect now in our province of never, ever being able to afford to own their own home. Many Ontarians wonder how they're even going to keep a roof over their head with rents rising the way that they are. This crisis is serious. Ontarians are hurting, Speaker. The average selling price for a home surpassed $1.3 million in our province. Here in the GTA, $1.8 million is the price of a home. How many people, Speaker, have to have their dreams dashed or their fears of rent hikes realized before this Premier, before the Ford government, realizes that it's his job, their job, to help them? Speaker, we acknowledge that the housing supply crisis is a long-term uh, plan for the government. We realize that there's no one silver bullet. There's not one bill or one set of initiatives that's going to, in, in the blink of an eye, solve the housing supply crisis. The only person who doesn't acknowledge that is the leader of the opposition, because every time we present uh, a plan to, to this legislature, her party continues to vote against it. We've seen uh, you know, the improvements in, in housing supply. We've seen record uh, housing construction uh, because of the initiatives that we put forward in 2019. But many of those initiatives, Speaker, have yet to be implemented by our municipal partners. So we know that the only way that we're going to solve order. this long-term problem is to have Position municipalities come to, order. to sign on with us. They've told us they're not there yet. They're not with us yet on the Housing Affordability Task Force. We need more time. Response? In the meantime, this plan will start right there. Yeah, yeah. As soon as it's passed, if it's passed, we'll start to provide relief that I think Ontarians both need and deserve. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, Ontarians have run out of time. There is a housing affordability crisis right now, and it has been growing since the last government was in office. And this government, Order. after four years, has just made things worse. People need real zoning reform so that new housing that people can actually afford can be built. We need rent control so tenants can be secure, that they can keep a roof over their heads and the heads of their families. We need investment in supportive housing, in social housing. Premier Ford's priority has Order. been his buddies. By, by prioritizing building a big highways uh, that, that lead to big houses that nobody can afford, Speaker. Government Why side, come to order. Premier help everyday Ontarians instead of paving a pathway for more money for his buddies? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, for 15 years, we saw inaction by the previous government 
propped up by the official opposition. Yep. For 15 years, those parties on that side of the House did absolutely nothing. They didn't even recognize that there was a housing uh, supply crisis, that there was a housing affordability crisis. On this side of the House, we recognize Government side that there needs to order. Be a plan, and we put together systemic changes to our planning and our, and our, and our building system to, to break those log jams at the municipal level, to ensure that permits get pulled and shovels get in the ground. But we need to do more, both in the immediate uh, future, but we also need to look at that long-term sustainable plan. The housing affordability roadmap is there. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to work towards it. Every year of a re-elected Doug Ford government is going to have a supply Order. action plan bill on the table to increase housing supply. I know what Stop the clock. Restart the clock. The next question. Thanks so much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. The Red Lake emergency room closed uh, for 24 hours on the weekend. Uh, patients that uh, needed services had to be sent by ambulance over 200 kilometres for more than two and a half hours to get emergency room attention. In rural, remote and northern communities, the doctor shortage is an absolute crisis. Healthcare professionals across the province, we know, are burned out. A memo that actually was prepared by 13 northern physicians uh, laid out the problem clearly for the government, and I quote, many communities across the north are suffering a severe shortage of physicians. It goes on to say, the decision and consequences of closures need to be owned by the government, including Ontario Health, and not the clinicians in communities. My question is pretty straightforward, Speaker. Why isn't the health and safety, the basic access to hospital emergency room care of Northern Ontarians a priority for this Premier, for the Ford government? And the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question. The health and safety of the people of Ontario has always been our government's foremost responsibility. We are aware that there are situations in parts of Ontario where we need more doctors, and that's why we're expanding a coverage in our medical schools to have more doctors graduate. We've expanded to 160 more undergraduate positions and 295 postgraduate positions, including the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, which will have 30 new undergraduate spots and 41 postgraduate spots. Recognizing that this isn't a solution for now, but it will be for the near future, we are also working with providing care in other locations, making sure that we have locums in place to ensure that people receive the coverage for their health care services wherever it is that they live in Ontario. The supplementary questions. Well, Speaker, the, uh, the memo, the briefing that Northern Doctors provided, and I'll ask a page to come here and provide it to the uh, minister in case she hasn't seen it, uh, but it's described the— can I have a page, please? Thank you so much. It's described the, um, the situation as dire, Speaker, dire. Staff suffering from increasing burnout. Small and large hospitals at risk of intermittent emergency department closures. Recruitment efforts that are not working, regardless of what this minister is trying to sell. Physicians have no time to carry on clinical hours as well as staff the hospitals and the ERs. It shouldn't be like this, Speaker, in a province like ours, in a province of such wealth. Northerners deserve to have quality, reliable access to health care. They shouldn't need to travel over 200 kilometres to get to an emergency room that's open to provide service. It is unacceptable. It is absolutely not okay question. or safe that this situation exists in our province. My question is, why hasn't Premier Ford uh, done what he needed to do to resolve this? Why has he abandoned the health care needs of Northerners? Minister Health. In fact, our government is taking action to protect the health care needs of Northerners, and I can advise that the Ministry, the Primary Health Care Branch and Capacity and Health Workforce Planning Branch, has been collaborating with Ontario Health, Ontario Health North and Health Force Ontario to find a resolution to recruitment and locum shortages by meeting regularly to identify potential opportunities to recruit new permanent or locum physicians. I can also advise that the newly ratified Ontario 
Medical Association Ministry of Health agreement has introduced a 4 per cent base salary increase to a number of groups, including the uh, physicians practicing, practicing out of Thessalon and Bruce Mines. So that is the action we are taking. We are aware that there's a concern. We are taking action because we need to make sure that every person in Ontario who has medical needs doesn't matter where they live, should have access to Response. emergency room physicians and to primary care. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, what the government needs to do is to listen carefully to the recommendations of these doctors. Dr. Sarah Vanderloo, the chair of the Northwestern, uh, Northwest Regional Chief of Staff Council, who serves as the chief of staff at Atacocan General Hospital, says that every small hospital in the region could see its emergency room temporarily close due to the shortages, just like what happened in Red Lake. Every single one is at risk of the same situation. When I spoke to Mayor Moda on the weekend, he was beside himself with worry. He was worried about if an accident were to occur, what would happen on those northern highways that are poorly maintained by this government? What would happen if there was an accident in when many of the, one of the many mines uh, that, uh, that exist around uh, Red Lake? He was extremely worried, and he should not have had to be. An incident of, of that nature would have been a foreseeable, a preventable, actually, human tragedy. It would have been horrifying. Now, we know it doesn't have to be this way, Speaker. Question. The doctors have proposed solutions. So my question is, uh, over four years in office, why has Premier Ford and his government made access to health care for Northerners worse instead of better? Of health. Thank you, Speaker. And Speaker, I think it's really important to understand exactly what happened in Red Lake because I believe that there, uh, it, it was no, known to the Ministry of Health, and the declaration was due to a service disruption, being a physician was unavailable for one day uh, in the emergency department at the Red Lake Margaret Cochinor Memorial Hospital from 8 o'clock on March 26th through to 8 o'clock on March 27th because of the physician uh, not being available. But the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre and the Ministry of Health coordinated patients to be redirected to Dryden, and air support was available for EMS transfers as required. As a result, no Leader of the Opposition, come to order. Thank you, Speaker. Ministry of Health. As a result, no one needed to be airlifted, and two people were transferred by ambulance. So they did receive the uh, health care that they needed. We are aware of these situations that we are providing for locums to be available or for people to be redirected as needed, so that no one needing care is left without that care, that they will receive it as early as possible. The next question, the member for Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, I'm sure you'll be surprised, as we all were, to learn that the Premier's $1 million man is back, Speaker. Yes, uh, after the Premier appointed his former tour director a desk job in Washington for more than $350,000 a year, Ian Todd is back in Ontario, Speaker. He collected his million bucks and the million dollar man title in Washington, rubbing elbows with the far right Republicans and scheduling, quote, office work on his calendars day after day with actually no meetings to be found. But he's back here, Speaker. He's back in Ontario. Mr. Todd's appointment expired in January, and he hasn't been replaced. But thankfully for him, he's managed to find himself some new employment. This time, Speaker, it's on the PC party campaign tour bus. So, Speaker, why did the Premier give his million-dollar man a job in Washington when the intent all along was to just help him find something to do between campaigns? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I don't think it comes as a shock to anybody who might be watching this or who has any knowledge of finance and trade that the NDP are not supportive of Ontario having a Order. representative in the United States of America, in the capital, to our largest trading partner, Mr. Speaker. Of course, the NDP would not want Ontario's interests being represented there. Order. Now, Mr. Speaker, we had to have, uh, we had to have a trade representative, a robust trade representative uh, following the 15 years of disastrous uh, liberal rule supported by the NDP, where thousands and thousands of jobs fleed this uh, this province, Mr. Speaker, we had become an unreliable trading partner. But thanks to the work of our of our officials in the ground, not only in Washington but in other parts of the United States, Mr. Speaker, it helped 
this Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade bring back uh -huh. jobs? Stellantis, GM, Ford, Honda, and more to come because of the work that this minister has been doing in cooperation with our trade representatives around the United States. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. This supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, Ian Todd's calendar is pretty sparse. From what we can find, uh, he may be the Premier's million-dollar man, but through Freedom of Information Act, we found that he didn't actually deliver a million bucks worth of work in Washington. Speaker, following the uh, U.S. election, Mr. Todd did manage to have a string of meetings with leading Republicans who probably do more damage uh, to our reputation uh, with the Biden administration than he helps at all. Speaker, don't forget, uh, Speaker, the Premier first tried to appoint his lacrosse playing buddy and a relative of his chief of staff to lucrative posts as Ontario's agents general. Two jobs that were never filled, even though at the time they were called mission critical. Speaker, shouldn't this province have anyone else as a representative than the Premier's hand-picked million-dollar buddy, buddy who's idly waiting uh, as his next gig as the PC Tour Director? Well, Mr. Speaker, again, uh, uh, our trade representatives have been very busy at work because what they're having to do, Mr. Speaker, is counter the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Buy America and the, the trade policies that would disadvantage the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That is why we have had to become so aggressive in supporting and advancing Ontario's interests across the United States, Mr. Speaker. Now, those are the very same policies that we're seeing in the United States that the Liberals and NDP brought to Ontario for 15 years, which saw jobs flee this province. It saw high energy prices, Mr. Speaker. It made it more costly to invest in the province of Ontario. In fact, Chrysler said that Ontario was the least competitive jurisdiction to do business and that if things did not change, they would not have invested here. Now, thankfully, because of the work that we're doing here in the province of Ontario across government ministries, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade Response. was able to land the biggest investment in the auto sector, saving thousands of jobs, creating even more jobs, Mr. Speaker, billions of dollars in economic activity, Mr. Speaker, ensuring prosperity, and that's what a strong, stable, conservative majority government delivers for the people of the province. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. All right. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. As we all know, some of the world's most delicious food is grown and made right here in Ontario. Not only do our province's farmers and food processors keep Ontario food on our tables, but they also contribute over $45 billion every year to Ontario's economy. Now, more than ever, there is demand for food that is made close to home. Ontario's agri-food sector has been ignored for far too long under the previous government. Agri-food employers are counting on our government to help grow their workforce and to kickstart business growth. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, please. What is our government doing to build a strong, competitive processing sector right here in the province of Ontario? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to share my appreciation to the great member from Brantford Brant for that question, because it's an opportunity to shine a spotlight on how our government has not only listened, but we're taking action and we're getting it done. After 15 years of neglect from the Liberal government, we actually are working with Ontario farmers, and we've identified the need to build capacity, particularly in the processing sector. And that's why, as of tomorrow, we are so thrilled to be able to present to our entire agri-food sector a $25 million strategic processing fund that will allow farmers from Ontario, whether they're beef farmers or vegetable growers, to realize their potential. Because after far too long, they, they have not been able to realize the market potential that they have. And so our strategic fund Spons? that comes li becomes live tomorrow will actually increase processing across this province. And not only are we going to ensure our food processing sector can meet the growing demand right here at home in Ontario, but we're going to make our farmers and our processors competitive. Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that response and for this investment. 
from new startups to existing facilities that are looking to expand and modernize the strategic agri-food processing fund will drive economic growth across the entire province of Ontario. Speaker, when we invest in agri-food, we invest in every community in Ontario. From the north to the east to into the GTHA, we invest in the careers of 720,000 Ontarians and their families. Speaker, these are good-paying jobs that will be key to our economic recovery. So, through you, Speaker, can the minister please tell us how our government is supporting the agri-food sector across the province? Minister of Agriculture. Very good. Speaker, I want everyone in the province of Ontario to know that our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, is standing tall beside that member from Brantford Brant, and we're supporting every single commodity the best we can, from ginseng growers right through to our chicken producers. And with that said, in particular with the processing investment that we're making, in addition to the agri-food innovation program, in addition to the program where we're matching available processing capacity with farmer demand. And we've introduced a strategic processing fund that opens as of tomorrow and until April 22nd, food processors across this province can apply to up to $3 million of support to construct brand new facilities that is very new, and I'm proud to be able to announce that today, as well as enable processors and abattoirs to expand their operations Response. and adopt the advanced technology. I want to share a quote with you. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we were in eastern Ontario, and Craig McLaughlin of the Beef Farmers. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetnon. Speaker, good morning. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, on this government's watch, the number of mining claims staked in Grassy Narrows territory against their will has exploded from a few hundred to over 4,000 claims. Grassy Narrows has been clear that they want no mining exploration and no industrial logging so that the land and the people can heal from the impacts of residential schools, child apprehension, damming, relocation, industrial logging, and mercury poisoning, Mr. Speaker. Grassy Narrows has asked this government to withdraw mining exploration and logging from their lands. How is this government going to respond, Question. Going to, respond to this call from the Chief of Grassy Narrows? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the, from the member opposite. Uh, look, obviously we understand uh, very, very clearly that uh, we have a constitutional obligation, a constitutional duty uh, to consult uh, with First Nations. Uh, it is something that we take uh, very, uh, very seriously, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, less of an obligation, uh, uh, however, Mr. Speaker, and more of something that we know that we have to do if we are to... Uh, 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 to uh, uh, to ensure that the, uh, Northern Ontario participates in the economic growth of the rest of the province, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we want to, uh, we will continue uh, uh, consultations and we will ensure that uh, we work as closely as we possibly can uh, with our partners in, uh, in First Nations communities across uh, Ontario, including Grassy Narrows. Supplementary question. Back to, back to the, speak, uh, the Premier. Speaker, uh, when this government went, met with Chief Forbester on November 18, there was no talk about mining exploration and logging. This government has granted thousands of mining claims and nine mining exploration permits on Grassy Narrows land without their consent or even consultation. However, the minister did uh, promise to visit Grassy Narrows to discuss these important concerns. More than four months later, Grassy Narrows has not heard from the minister. Speaker, uh, why has the minister not been to Grassy Narrows? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Look, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I said uh, uh, in the earlier question uh, answer, excuse me, uh, we understand the uh, the constitutional uh, obligation uh, uh, that requires uh, uh, to to consult, the duty to consult, and we're going to continue to do that. But as I also said, uh, we look at it less as an obligation and more as an important part of helping us ensure that all of Ontario, including Northern Ontario, can participate in the economic growth that is so important, uh, not only uh, to the province of Ontario but frankly to the entire uh, country, Mr. Speaker. So we're going to continue to do that. The minister himself has worked within uh, First Nations communities his entire uh, career, Mr. Speaker, whether it was as a nurse, whether it was as a, as a federal uh, uh, minister, and now as a minister in, in the province of Ontario. Uh, we are going to continue to do that. Look, it's very clear, Mr. Speaker, the previous Liberal government all but abandoned Northern Ontario. They left them out of any attempts to, uh, to grow and to uh, have a prosperous north just as, uh, as the south uh, was, Mr. Speaker. We are ensuring, we are ensuring that we work with First Nations so that all can participate in, in the economic growth that is so important, not only to Southern Ontario, but to Northern Ontario. And we can reduce that disparity between north and south, urban and rural, Mr. Speaker, but we can't do it without our partners in First Nations. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Under the Premier's watch, the average home price in Toronto has gone from $787,000 to $1.3 million. And after almost four years in office, the government's primary response to the housing affordability crisis is to consult. It suggests, and I would suggest, that the Premier consult the Ontario Greens' housing affordability strategy if he needs some solutions. Ontario is in a housing crisis, and we need action now. There was a time when the Ontario government provided funding for nonprofits and co-ops to build housing that people could actually afford. So, Speaker, will the Premier commit to funding the funding necessary to build 160,000 deeply affordable homes supporting nonprofits and co-ops in the spring budget? Um, speaker, we uh, nonprofits and co-ops uh, that we want to keep them in the system. That's why our community housing renewal strategy uh, is being implemented. Since 2019, we've been working with those two uh, sectors, and we now have published our path forward. Um, you know, unlike the previous government that had 15 years to deal with this, we're actually acting upon the Auditor General's recommendations from 2017 on their government. We're actually trying to ensure that the, those co-ops stay in the system. What keeps me up at night, the, uh, Speaker, is the fact that, that we could lose 105,000 uh, community housing uh, properties, so we need to do everything we can to keep them in the system. You know, but, Speaker, what I'm concerned about is we've had a campaign going. Many municipalities have supported us on our call to the federal government for uh, our fair share. We, we're owed $490 million. What? Greens and this leader have never come forward and supported us. So you want to build more affordable and supportive housing? Sign our agreement to the federal government and support that extra $480 million. I'll send him a supplementary question. Speaker, the bitter irony, especially for young people, is that the government's new bill has no commitment to actually building housing that's affordable for people. Essentially, every housing expert has come out panning the government's bill because it's clear, and they've said this, the experts have said this, it's clear that the government doesn't understand the severity of the crisis or the urgency of needed action. If the province wants to work with the federal government, absolutely we should do that. But it means the province has to come to the table with money and with a commitment to building 160,000 affordable homes in this province. So if the housing minister is not going to answer it, maybe the finance minister will. Will there be money in the spring budget Question. to build housing that people can actually afford in this province? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. You know, Speaker, we put our money where our mouth is in terms of dollars to municipalities. We provided record dollars 
uh, for homelessness supports. We just made an announcement last week that added more dollars in the system and consolidated supportive housing programs to make sure there were extra dollars in the system. We continue uh, to call on the federal government in their budget. Uh, to recognize that we're not getting our fair share paid. We're putting our, our skin in the game. We're ensuring that we're putting up land and dollars to our municipal partners and to non-for-profits and co-ops, but we need some partners. And every time, Speaker, and again, I, I can't emphasize this enough, every time we put uh, recommendations, bills, regulations forward that are going to help the situation, that is going to help solve the housing supply crisis, this member for Guelph, on behalf of the Green Party, votes against it every single time, Speaker. It's not going to Response? make sure that housing is affordable when you keep opposing every measure that's going to help the supply crisis. The next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, my constituents in Oakville, North Burlington, and indeed all Ontarians, were pleased to see Ontario achieve the right deal on childcare with the federal government. And I would like to congratulate the minister for getting it done and for all working families in our province. During negotiations, the premier, the education minister, and our government repeatedly called on the federal government to recognize the unique components of Ontario's childcare system. We believe it is important to provide flexibility and parental choice to parents. One important component is the CARE tax credit. Speaker, through you to the minister, can Ontario families count on our government continuing the CARE tax credit? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for Oakville and North Burlington for her leadership in the legislature. Indeed, Speaker, our government, our Progressive Conservative Party, believes in respecting the choices parents make and in recognizing the inherent costs to raise a child. And that's why we are, in addition to delivering $10 daycare on average by year 2025, in addition to the 50 per cent reduction that will be realized by this Christmas of this year, we are going to preserve the Ontario Child Care Tax Credit, a critical form of relief that provides up to 75 per cent of child care expenses for families that are eligible for relief up to $6,000 per child per year. Mr. Speaker, this is an important way we can help reduce the costs and increase support for working people. It is regrettable that the New Democrats and Liberals have opposed this measure, but Ontario families can count on our government to deliver $10 daycare by 2025 and Months? continue to provide direct financial relief, thousands of dollars on average, through the Ontario Child Care Tax Credit. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for, for your answer. Uh, speaker, maintaining an array of options for parents to access affordable childcare will help families, our youngest learners, and the economy. Speaker, the government has repeatedly said that affordability and sustainability were guiding principles to land the right deal for the province of Ontario. Ensuring relief from childcare costs for working families has been a priority of this government since negotiations began. Speaker, can the Minister of Education share with parents how much families save through Ontario's plan and how quickly parents will realize the benefits? Good, good question. Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you to the member opposite. You know, Mr. Speaker, what we did not do, what the Liberal Party would have done, is left $3 billion off the table. They would have left behind families with children in for-profit childcare, and they would have left a year of investment out of reach. Mr. Speaker, Order. our government stood up to the federal government to deliver a better deal for Ontario families, and we are proud to see a 25 per cent reduction immediately on average for families, 50 per cent by Christmas, representing roughly $4,000 per child uh, in the province of Ontario. It will rise to $12,000, Speaker, in year 2023. This is real financial relief to support families, to get women working in the economy, and to deliver the relief that families for generations have heard politicians speak about. They can count on our Premier to get the job done for Ontario families. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. Next question, the member for London West. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, for five weeks, the world has watched in horror the unspeakable suffering of the Ukrainian people and saluted their incredible courage. In my community, Londoners are ready and waiting to welcome Ukrainians fleeing Putin's illegal invasion into their homes. But Ola Nowasad from the London Ukrainian Congress contacted me to say host families are worried they may have to cover health care costs for Ukrainians who won't have OHIP coverage right away. On top of routine health care needs, many Ukrainians have experienced significant physical and mental trauma. They and all who flee to Canada for refuge deserve access to comprehensive health care when they arrive. Speaker, will this government commit to waiving the OHIP waiting period for Ukrainians and those seeking refuge in Ontario. To reply, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. This is a really important issue because what's happening in Ukraine right now is horrifying and absolutely heartbreaking to all of us. And so we're all asking ourselves what can we do individually and as a government to uh, help people who are fleeing the country right now. I can advise that right now we do have uh, five pediatric patients at the uh, Hospital for Sick Children who need oncology assistance. Uh, they are here now with their families. There's more that we can do, however, and this is something that we, is a, a subject of urgent discussion within the Ministry of Health and across all of our ministries to understand what we can do to help recognizing that people will need significant uh, both physical health and mental health uh, needs uh, when they do come to Canada and when, you, when they do come to Ontario. Supplementary. Speaker, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees reports that over 4 million Ukrainians have fled their home country, and tens of thousands of those people have already applied for entry into Canada. Ontario must be ready to support Ukrainians when they arrive. Quebec, British Columbia, and Newfoundland have all announced that they will waive health coverage waiting periods for Ukrainians entering the province under the Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel. More than 12,000 people have already signed an online petition asking Ontario to do the same. I ask again, Speaker, will this government commit right now to following the lead of the other provinces and waive the OHIP waiting period for Ukrainians and others seeking refuge in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Health to reply. Thank you. Well, we certainly recognize that Canada has a responsibility to take in refugees from Ukraine, as many other countries have done as well. And of course, you will know that it's the federal government's responsibility to indicate how many and when they will be able to come in. But we will be ready. We do recognize that Ontario also has a responsibility. I can't commit specifically right as of this moment what we will be able to do, but I can tell you that uh, waiving coverage for OHIP is something that is specifically and urgently being being discussed by our government right now. And the next question, the member for Ottawa South. Much speaker. Speaker, today is supposed to be the last day that the Premier has to deliver a budget. But the Premier, well, he changed his own law for his own convenience, just so he doesn't have to pay a fine right before an election. Instead, he's been uh, flitting around the province like uh, Tinkerbell, spreading billions like it was pixie dust. Pixie dust, like it was going to make the pandemic go away. Speaker, we don't need magic. We don't need pixie dust. We simply need a plan to get our vaccination rates up. So, Speaker, Order. through you, how is it in the Premier's plan to reopen? There is no plan to get Ontarians' vaccination rates up. Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Well, I can advise the member opposite that we do have a very specific vaccination plan to get more Ontarians vaccinated. We passed the 32 million mark last week. We have, at this moment, a total shots in arms as of today, 32,064,229. We are also moving forward. I can advise that 92.8 per cent of Ontarians have had partial vaccination. 90.9 per cent have had two doses. We're working on the booster shots, and we're also examining whether a fourth 
shot is necessary, an extra booster. We're waiting for NACI's advice that should come later today about what age group should be receiving the fourth vaccination. If necessary, we are actively moving on this, and we're continuing with our plan across the province of Ontario. I'm just kind of surprised that the Minister of Health doesn't rec recognize that there's a problem. So in the Premier's plan to stay open, the word vaccines is mentioned once, and only in reference to manufacturing. So the single most important thing we can do to protect Ontarians and protect our economy isn't even in his plan. I don't know about you, but I think that's incredible. We're at the back of the pack for vaccinating our children. Only one-third of five, and a, uh, five to 11-year-olds have a second dose, and our third doses are at 50 percent. And I don't know about you, Minister, but I think for the rest of us here, 50 percent doesn't cut it. So anti-vaxxers, they're spreading mis misinformation. We know that. They work 24-7. It's all over the web, all the time. We all see it. We even hear it in here. So why is this question? Premier missing in action, asleep at the switch. Where is a plan to get our vaccination rates up to where we need to be? Because it's the most important thing we can do right now, and it's clearly not in your plan. Minister of Health. Well, it clearly is in our plan. We do have a plan to increase the vaccination rates. With 92.8 per cent of uh, Ontarians partially vaccinated, 90.9 per cent having received the second dose, we are distributing the third doses. Order. We do have them available. We have clinics in schools. Order. We have primary care that's providing them. They're available in pharmacies as well. We also have the GoVax buses that are going to locations where there are low Member for Ottawa South, come to order. We're making sure that people in Congregate care, get help. We've been going to uh, community uh, living organizations and other organizations, making sure that people who are not able to come to us, we can go to them. So we're continuing to work on that, and we will continue until we get every person in Ontario vaccinated who wishes to be vaccinated. Here, here. Next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Great, Minister. Speaker, as we all know, Ontario has a housing crisis driven by a severe shortage of supply. Young families, seniors, all hardworking people are desperate for housing that meets their unique needs. And our government is using every resource at our disposal to build all kinds of homes. But, Speaker, some city councils, including Hamilton Council, are pushing an anti-housing and anti-growth ideology that is preventing Order. homes from being built and driving up home prices. This includes Hamilton Council refusing to expand urban boundaries despite their own staff admitting Hamilton does not have enough land within our existing urban boundaries in which to build the homes we need. Speaker, through you, what is the minister Hamilton doing Mountain to Order. address Question. this issue? Great question. Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. That's a, that is a great question. Uh, one of the proposed measures under the bill would give me the authority to, uh, to pause the 120-day timeline on reviewing official plans. Official plans are a critical tool uh, to address the housing crisis because they set out that long-term plan on how the municipality will create uh, the amount of homes, jobs, and community infrastructure it needs over the long term. We have a serious housing crisis in Ontario, Speaker, and the official plans that I've seen, like Hamilton and Ottawa, uh, don't maximize the housing outcomes for Ontarians and instead prioritize anti-growth and anti-housing ideology. If passed, I would pause the timeline on the official plans that I have received, and I would consider referring them to the Ontario Land Tribunal as an impartial adjudicator. I've not yet received Hamilton's official plan, but I want to emphasize to the House that I'm prepared to take Response. the same approach if Hamilton's official plan doesn't maximize housing for the hardworking hard people of Hamilton, including those in flamborough glenbrook The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Minister. The average price of a home in Hamilton, Hamilton, is over a million dollars, wow. and that is shutting out too many people of all ages. Wow. The word crisis is an understatement. Speaker, as the minister has said, our government is taking a long-term strategy to address the housing crisis and to provide 
more attainable housing options for all Ontarians. Speaker, through you, will the minister share the government's long-term strategy to address the housing crisis? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, Speaker, and I want to again thank uh, the member for her incredible advocacy in her riding and uh, and in the Hamilton area. Uh, More Homes for Everyone proposes uh, smart, uh, targeted policies in the immediate term uh, that would uh, help get housing built faster, get shovels in the ground, uh, and build all types of housing uh, for Ontarians that deserve it. Over the long term, though, Speaker, the Housing Affordability Task Force is our government's housing roadmap. We commit to, to implementing the task force recommendation with a housing supply action plan every year over the next four years. The first step, though, Speaker, is to deliver on the task force's report on our consultation on the concept of multi-generational community uh, to bring in gentle density. This consultation would feed into our housing supply working group, which my ministry would establish in the summer to engage with municipalities to ensure that they actively support and are willing to implement the measures uh, that uh, we need to uh, implement on the ground. With these measures, we're what? collaborating with a, a new uh, opportunity with the Housing Affordability Task Force. We need municipalities to uh, pull their weight, get things done on the ground, and get shovels in the ground for Ontario. The next question, the member for Brampton, please. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Brampton is facing a health care crisis because of years of Liberal and Conservative neglect. Now, last year, the Premier came to Brampton and he didn't even announce a hospital. He announced a few more beds for Peel Memorial with no emergency room. Now we've learned that what he did announce, Bramptonians are going to have to pay for. Why does the Premier think it's okay? For Bramptonians to pay to fix a health care crisis created by him and the Liberals. Mr. Hill. Thank you. Well, Speaker, you know, this is a really curious question from the member opposite. Because for 15 years, the Liberals, propped up by the NDP, heard the calls for more health care in Brampton. And what do they do? They Both sides no of the house come to order. And they ignore them. Okay. It's our government that's saying yes here, to here, a new here. hospital that's going to include over 250 new patient beds and includes a 24-7 emergency department. In fact, the mayor of Brampton was very enthusiastic about the announcement and said Order. this is a huge step in the right direction, and it's actually six times larger than the original project that was planned only a few years ago. Why would the, pre the mayor of Brampton say that, and the, this member is alleging that we're not providing services? We're providing those services, here, here. and we will deliver them. Here, here, here. Supplementary question? The Premier. So let me get this straight. The Premier comes to Brampton and doesn't even announce Government a hospital, side come to order. and what little he does announce, Bramptonians are going to have to pay for it. Come to I want to ask the, the Premier this. Name me another city in Canada that has over 700,000 people, is one of the fastest growing, and has only one hospital. Does the Premier think that this is acceptable? Enough is enough. Brampton has been left behind for far too long. Will the Conservative Order. Follow, li finally listen to what we in the NDP have been saying this whole time? Invest in Brampton and our health care crisis. And for Brampton, that means three hospitals with three emergency rooms paid for by the provincial government not the good people of Brampton. President of the Treasury Board, please come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, the city of Brampton is going to have and receive the largest investment in health care in its history. This includes a new hospital, a second hospital for the, uh, for the city of Brampton, which was neglected for 15 years by the previous government. And this in. also includes a new medical school, Mr. Speaker, yes. for the people of Brampton so that the kids that live and stay in Brampton can then also, at one point, work in Brampton, deliver care in Brampton. And, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to build upon this. Our government has announced over 600 long-term care beds for the city of Brampton, Mr. Wow. Speaker. There has been no government that has delivered more for the people of Brampton Response? than this government under the leadership yeah. of Premier yeah. Ford.
Please start the call. Member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. There are over 28,000 children and youth on wait lists for mental health care services, and wait times can reach up to 2.5 years. The impact of the pandemic has been hard on our kids. According to Sick Kids, over 70 percent of children reported worsened mental health during the initial lockdowns. Speaker, mental health is health, and it should be available when and where our kids need it, not months, even years down the road. So will the Premier commit today to delivering the additional $150 million targeted to youth mental health in this year's budget that is needed to reduce wait times for children's mental health services Question. to under 30 days. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for that question. Mr. Speaker, from day one, when our government was elected, we made mental health and addictions a priority. Yes. In fact, I am the first Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions in the history of the province of Ontario. That that, Mr. Speaker, is the commitment that this Premier made and that our government made to ensure that mental health and addiction was looked after in the province of Ontario by creating those continuums of care. But to put behind the fact that there's a ministry created is the fact that we have $3.8 billion that has been invest invested on an annualized basis, 174, 175, 176, and now we're investing $525 million here, here. annually in mental health and addictions in the province of Ontario to create those, those uh, continuums of Response. care. And of course, what we've done is we're looking at the lifespan and addressing the issue for the children. And in the supplemental, I'll give you more details as to, uh, as to the investments that are being made. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I want to be clear. I respect the Associate Minister's work on this issue. I actually appreciate him coming to Guelph and providing funding for a youth wellness hub. But let's be clear with people and honest with people. Our kids need more. I met a youth on a suicide watch list who had to meet wait months to access therapy. And this is happening all across the province. So let me repeat, some youth are waiting up to 2.5 years to access services. Speaker, everything is not okay when it comes to youth mental health, and our kids need all of us, everybody in this house, to do better. So I'm offering the Premier an opportunity today to say yes to an additional $150 million on top of what's already been invested in mental health in this year's budget to reduce wait times Question. for our children to less than 30 days. Yes or no, will the government support this request? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I would like to reiterate the importance of mental health as it relates to children and youth. Through the Ministry of Education, substantial sums of money, four times what has ever been invested by previous governments, by the, for, the, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP. Those investments have been made and are, are having effects and Im impact on children. In addition to that, in the continuum of care, which is so important, as kids need supports outside of the school day, we invested 5%. We increased the overall budget by 5% to all children and youth uh, operators within the continuum of care, outside of the schools, to provide additional supports. We've created youth wellness hubs and continue to invest through the Addiction Recovery Fund in additional youth and wellness hubs, because it's not just about giving them treatment, it's also what? about building resiliency and providing them with the supports they need to become better, stronger, and be able to participate fully in school and, of course, in life later on. So we are. Thank you very much. The member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Speaker. Um, my question is to the Premier. I have stood in this House on many occasions and spoke of how young people and families in my fine community of York Southwestern can no longer afford to stay living in the neighborhoods they were raised in. 
The cost of buying a new home or renting an apartment is simply not affordable. On this side of the House, we have offered many solutions to the housing crisis, and we have been ignored, just like this government ignored many of the recommendations of their own housing task force. With prices skyrocketing, families in my riding need affordable housing. Why is this Premier failing to address the need for such housing in communities like York Southwestern? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, well Speaker, through, through you to the honourable member, you're, you're, you're the MPP for York Southwestern. Your federal colleague uh, in your own riding is the federal housing minister. And, and I would think of all New Democrats that sit in this chamber, that there be one New Democrat that would actually come forward and agree with us when we're asking the federal government for our fair share of an extra $480 million. So, so here's something that the member opposite can do for me and can do for residents in his riding, and that's make that overture. You know, some New Democrat has got to stand up uh, for more dollars and the fact that we need our fair share to build more affordable housing in our rights. The other thing that I could, uh, through you, Speaker, that I could suggest to the honourable member is that when we table a housing initiative, like we did with More Homes, More Choice in 2019, our housing action plan, that when we Bonds. do measures that result in more shovels in the ground to help this crisis, that the member would break away from his party, that the member would stand up for the residents of York Southwestern and vote for order. Order. Supplementary. Well, the member is uh, out of order, and he is the Minister of Housing responsible for Ontario. Back to the Premier. So many families see home ownership as out of reach because of these high prices, and yet their rents are going up even more as well. I have raised the case of tenants in my community facing massive rent increases if they change units and of the issues of above uh, guideline rent increases being abused and used as a tool to jack up rents, in some cases as much as 73%. With half of the population in my community residing in apartments, I hear regularly of their struggles with affordability. This government ended rent control on all new units when they arrived in office in 2018 which is the responsibility of this minister, which has led to devastating rent increases Question. for families. Why is this government, Mr. Speaker, refusing to bring back real rent control and close the loopholes that empower landlords to effect good tenants and allow rents to skyrocket? Member for Rent for Nicholson Pembroke, come to order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. Mr. Speaker, this, this member has zero credibility on the issue that he just asked. The NDP, when we as a government put forward uh, an, a, a bill that required landlords to make efforts to renegotiate a repayment agreement if the tenant had rent arrears, uh, that member voted no. When we increased fines under the Residential Tenancies Act, to $50,000 to an individual and uh, $250,000 for a corporation in terms, they voted against it. When we asked that landlords disclose to uh, the Landlord Tenant Board whether they've ever filed for a rent eviction, this uh, NDP uh. voted uh, no. When we actually, and this, I can't believe this, Speaker, when we, we increased tenant compensation for bad faith evictions, allowing the Landlord Tenant Board to give another 12 months rent to that tenant. Again, I can't, I can't believe the NDP voted no. Wow. Every time sure. this government puts in place protections for tenants, this NDP says one thing. This is Andrea Horvath's problem. She says one thing and then. Yeah, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw. The next question the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, a draft document circulated by Ontario Ministry of Education outlined plans to download medical and potentially clinical support services for students with disabilities onto unqualified school staff. It says that school board personnel with no professional health or medical backgrounds could soon be tasked with medical responsibilities. This government seems to be planning to have these education professionals perform tasks, including 
oral and nasal suction, catheterization, and injecting medication. Disability advocacy groups and teachers' unions are extremely concerned about this plan that would place disabled students in harm's way. Mr. Speaker, this is cruel, reckless, and really unfair to the students and to the school professionals. Can the Minister of Education confirm or deny whether Question. he plans to download medical duties onto untrained school board employees? Minister of Education. Thank you to the member opposite for the question. I want to report and confirm that the last time the PPM, the, the policy uh, the surrounding this issue, was first conceived and written in 1984. Uh, we are consulting with the sector to ensure we provide those critical services uh, to families. And obviously, our first priority is to ensure that children with special education needs and disability are cared for. It's the basis for why our government has increased investment to the highest levels for children with special education exceptionality uh, to the highest levels in provincial history. Speaker, it's now well over $3.25 billion in funding that has increased by over $100 million just from the year prior. Speaker. Uh, we understand how critical it is to support these children. It's why the staffing has been enhanced. There's now 3,000, rather $300 million provided for the coming school year, specifically to hire more EAs, more ECs, more special education teachers to give the care that these kids deserve. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, about the health and safety in schools, it's an issue that needs to be taken seriously. On February 1st, the Minister of Education said that the schools would be getting rapid tests every two weeks from then on. That was back February 1st. That's been two months. And teachers have reported to me that they haven't been receiving those rapid tests that they're supposed to be distributing to students. Now, as much as we want this pandemic to be over, you know, we can't simply not be testing for COVID anymore. It gives the family and the students the confidence to go to school knowing that they're they're, with, whether they're symptomatic or not, that they're not going to be transmitting the uh, disease. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Minister Question. of Education admit that schools have not been receiving the adequate number of rapid tests for, from this government, and why? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the member opposite should be, uh, should be assured that there's 7 million rapid tests that are being sent to school boards every single month in the province of Ontario. The Deputy Premier has just confirmed the continuation of rapid tests in our communities well into the summer for the purpose of enabling families and individuals um, to reduce the risk before they enter congregate settings and they pursue their careers and their schools and studies. Mr. Speaker, in addition, to the 73,000 HEPA units that are in classrooms in Ottawa and all regions of Ontario, the most HEPA units in all provinces combined as of this past September. Our government is taking it further with an additional deployment of 49,000, working with the Minister of Government Consumer Services to deploy 40,000 net new HEPA units to schools, 9,000 for childcare in the month of March and the early weeks of April to reduce risk and build confidence and ensure our children can remain in class learning. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Government House Leader has a point of order. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. In accordance with uh, Standing Order uh, 59, I will uh, outline uh, uh, business for next week and thank all colleagues for uh, what has been a very productive week uh, uh, this week, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so on Monday, April the 4th, uh, during routine proceedings, uh, a new government bill will be introduced. That afternoon, a take-note debate uh, with respect to the 120-day report on the blockade emergency. On Tuesday, April 5th in the morning, we will return to Bill 88, Working for Workers Act. Before question period on that day, there will be a tribute to former member Mr. David Ramsey. In the afternoon, we will return back to Bill 88, uh, Working for Workers Act. In the evening, PMB ballot item uh, 37, uh, standing in the name of the member for Thunder Bay at Akokim. Um, on Wednesday, April 6th in the morning, uh, Bill 88 in the afternoon, uh, Bill 88 uh, as well a, uh, as a bill that will be introduced. Uh, in the evening, there will be PMB ballot item number 35, standing in the name, uh, which is Bill 104 in the name of the member for Durham, and it's the Connected Communities Act. Uh, that evening, there will be a, a, a night sitting uh, on the 6th and it will be with respect to the bill that will be introduced earlier in the week. On Thursday, April 7th, uh, Speaker, a, uh, in the morning, uh, we will be debating the bill that was previously introduced. 
Uh, in the afternoon, Speaker, we will have a take note debate, and I do encourage all members to be in the House uh, for uh, the take note debate in the afternoon of Thursday, April 7th. Uh, we will be allowing members who are uh, retiring uh, to uh, uh, give speeches with respect to the importance of uh, uh, people in their lives and the, the amazing contributions that they have, uh, have made uh, to the people of Ontario. Uh, and uh, I would encourage all members uh, to be here for, uh, uh, for, that, uh, uh, for that, Mr. Speaker. That evening, we will have ballot, PMB ballot item number 39, uh, the member for Brampton North. Uh, and there will be another evening, uh, 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 evening session as well, and it will be with respect to a bill that will be introduced earlier in the week. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Kiewetnong has a point of order. Uh, miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge today is the uh, National Indigenous Languages Day. I want to do a big shout out to uh, the language speakers, the Indigenous language speakers, but also uh, the Indigenous people that are reconnecting with their language, with their identity, and, uh, and the way of life. Miigwech maad. Awashu ba kichini an shimna anu kuma kino ga in studio yak. Awashu maad kichini da god kichigi jonan. I'm just talking to uh, the language speakers. Our language is really important. Miigwech. I beg to inform the House that the following document has been tabled, a report concerning Jessica Bell, member for University Rosedale from the Office of the Integrity Commissioner of Ontario. Before question period, I informed the House that the Manitoba legislative interns were uh, tuning in today. They are Nathan Duick, Selena Oster, Sanjam Penag, Christina Rabbit, uh, Carson Ransom, and Aidan Trembath. Once again, we're delighted that they were able to watch us today, and I hope that, uh, that they're impressed. <laughs> Next, we have a deferred vote on the motion for a second reading of Bill 106, an act to enact two acts and amend various other acts. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell. <laughs> 